So we'll talk about multi-calibration, universal adaptability and causality. And usually if this was a conference and when you put such a title, then the next natural line is to say, during the talk, I will explain all of these terms, right? But this is a workshop, so you're here to work. So instead, what I'll do is I'll tell you a little bit about multi-calibration, but Guy did most of the work for me. And I'll talk mostly about universal adaptability, and you can explain to me causality after. So that's the plan. Most of what we're going to talk about is this work uh, on universal adaptability with Michael King, Christoph Kern, Shafi Goldwasser, Frauke uh, Quarter. And we have here uh, Christoph, Michael, and Shafi. Uh, but um, Christoph and Michael wave that kind of uh, led this project felt very strongly that we should give the new uh, talent some exposure. So here I am. Um, so I'm mostly going to talk about that and talk about some work in progress. And then I'll add with some uh, musings on, of my own, which nobody is responsible for. Uh, not necessarily even I. Okay, so what, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about this problem of adapting a study, a research, from a target distribution, from a source distribution to a target distribution. And I'm going to start by describing the, uh, the most common approach paradigm uh, for this, which is through a uh, propensity scoring. Um, and then I move to this new approach, kind of an alternative paradigm that we can call universal adaptation. And the motivation would be um, when we want to talk about adapting from one source to multiple targets, that it will be motivated beyond that. And then um, we'll see how to, so we'll describe this notion and then we'll see how multi-calibration that we already heard about, that comes from the literature about fairness, uh, can help us get this strong notion. And finally, I'll re remember that I was invited to a workshop on causality. And, and I'll talk a little bit about things that are perhaps even more related to causality, mostly about um, the way propensity scores are used to estimate the treatment effects. And then, then I'll get my, to my musings about multi-calibration causality, uh, which can be completely off, or by the end of this workshop, we can have a formal result. So we'll see. Okay, good. Um, so what is this problem of generalization? We have a study in some source distribution. In the study we have, uh, uh, covariates features for many individuals and the corresponding outcomes for them. And we want to translate it to some target distribution, which may be different, uh, where we have the individuals, but we don't have the outcomes. So you can think about the source as for a survey, let's say a phone survey that only uh, uh, reaches people with cell phones that are willing to answer surveys. Who are these people? I don't know. And then um, perhaps uh, T is for the true uh, population we want to, uh, to actually study. Alternatively, S can be for Stanford, a study in Stanford hospital. And we want to apply it in a different population, perhaps uh, for T, the Bronx. Uh, hospital. That's the level of creativity we have here. So, so that's the setting. And let's give us a few uh, notations. We don't really going to use them too much, but still, X is the, um, the, the range of covariates, features of individuals. For every individual, we collect a lot of features. I know I know I'm going to tell you how many features there could be uh, in their talk later. And then there is an outcome that we want to predict. Um, that's the outcome uh, of interest. In this talk, it could be 
a real outcome between zero and one, but you can also think about just a binary outcome. Uh, had a heart attack, didn't have a heart attack. Z is the source versus target population. And we'll think about it as a random variable, which is strange. I mean, for me, coming from CS, thinking about it as a random variable is a bit strange. So uh, for, for those that find it strange, think about defining indistinguishability by thinking about two distribution and you flip the coin, giving you one or the other. So think about Z as a uniform, a uniform bit telling you if you're in the source or the target. And what we want to estimate is the expectation of the outcome uh, over the target. But the information we have is in the source. Uh, this is the very the most basic statistic we may care about, but um, what we're talking about will apply for more sophisticated statistics. Okay, so that's the setup. What are the key assumptions that will let us do that? The first assumption is conditional independence. We're saying that Y, the outcome we're predicting, and Z, telling us if we're in the source or the target, are independent conditioned on X. This essentially says that what we're trying to predict is the same. The kind of the relation between the uh, covariates and the outcome is the same in the source and the uh, target. Otherwise, perhaps we cannot learn from the source anything about the target. The source distribution is, is different than the target distribution. So I don't know what's biased or not, but they're different. Whether or not your product is going to be at least the source your right. But like you're, if you think of it from a survey context, isn't it saying that whether or not your survey doesn't depend right. on your right? Absolutely. It means that the process is unbiased. Right. That's that's a good uh, uh, observation. And then, um, yeah, I'm not sure if we need that that strongly, but but that's that's I guess what the assumption says. And we talk about uh, when we talk about frequent effect, we actually talk about things where there is a relation. Um, and then uh, we we'll, we want sufficient uh, representation. So we want it to be the case that no large uh, subpopulation in the target is completely unrepresented in the source. Everything has to be at least slightly represented. So we have information about this subpopulation. Otherwise, uh, we have no chance on, of learning what, how to deal with this population. That kind of should we already kind of connect us to a little bit of fairness because one issue is underrepresentation of, of the subpopulations. So both of these are required uh, for our approach, universal adaptability, but it's also required for the prevalent approach of uh, propensity scoring. And um, in fact, it's kind of required to some extent for, for saying anything, unless you're making other assumptions that may be as strong or strong. And so what is this propensity score? We model, these are, this is a way to model the shift in the distribution between the source and the target. And um, so odds of sampling a given individual X from the source versus the odds of sampling it in the target. Kind of hinting on, on what guys uh, talked about the meaning of individual probabilities. That's completely unclear what this means, but we will not talk about it. I'll be happy to talk uh, offline. But the way, I mean, what this is supposed to be is that uh, condition on a particular individual, what's the probability that we are in the source? And that's why we thought about this kind of think about uh, that you're sampling either from the source or from the target with uh, the same probability. And then given that you saw an individual, what's the probability it's from the source? Um, if it was the same distribution, this would be half, right? 
uh, but um, it's not the same distribution. What we want it to, to be is that this profanity scores is bounded away from zero. And because if it's zero, it means that this individual is completely not represented in the source. And therefore we cannot learn about it in the target. This is a requirement about individuals. We talked about subpopulations, we can extend it. Just know that um, one minus this, uh, this term EST is the probability that it's from the target. And what we're really interested in is the ratio. What the probability that it's in target over what it's, what's the probability that it's in the source? What's the relation between them? And uh, yeah, good. Questions? Okay. So how do we use that? Um, under this assumption of conditional uh, independence, you can learn this simple statistic that we talked about in the target by kind of weighing uh, differently the, the outcomes in the source. So you can think about it as reweighing uh, Y or you can think about it as reweighing X's. And you can even think about it as you, given a, a, a sample of the source, you can kind of create with these weights a sample from the target, and then you can learn there. So what is this uh, paradigm? You estimate these propensity scores using unlabeled samples from the source and the target. And then now that you have those, this propensity score, uh, you're going to, um, to do this reweigh. In a sense, as I said, you can think about it as creating the target distribution from the source distribution. That's, that's a paradigm that many of you probably know very well. The thing is that we don't have these propensity scores. So what do we do here? We do what we do everywhere. And we try to learn it from some class. So think about sigma as a class of potentially uh, potential propensity scores. And, and this class has to be bounded complexity, so of bounded complexity. So you have a chance of learning. And now what we're going to do is instead of these propensity scores, we're going to try to fit, try to learn uh, some sigma that would represent for us uh, the propensity score. And then we will do the reweighing with sigma playing the role of the propensity score. So that's now we have the entire paradigm. Good. You happy? So here are reasons not to be happy. Um, one is that the assumptions may not always hold. Unfortunately, we can't do anything about it either. The other one is that the true propensity score may not be in this sigma maybe even far from sigma. Our theorems say nothing about this case, but there is some reason to think that perhaps we can still do something interesting in this case. But I won't talk about it uh, much. But what we really want, the real challenge that motivates this work is that when you have, when you do the training, when you come up with this propensity score, you need labeled examples from the source and the target. And this may be unrealistic in several cases. So here are some cases in which it's unrealistic. First, it could be that we want to apply the same study from Stanford in many hospitals. And so what are we going to do? We're going to do all this sharing uh, with every hospital, which is costly and retrain for every uh, hospital. This is not realistic. The other one is that perhaps this distribution doesn't exist now. We want to apply this study for Stanford in five years. The population may change in five years, but we cannot uh, at the time of training take this uh, non-existent distribution into account. Finally, kind of coming from privacy kind of perspectives, there are limitations of sharing information. And here we want to share a lot of information. We want to share the covariates of individuals. 
So now this kind of motivates our attempt to get into universal adaptability. I want to do something at the source, let's say at Stanford, that would somehow be universally applicable to all these various targets. So that's the motivation. That's the picture. So now we don't have a single target, we have many targets. And the way I want to do this kind of adaptation is in a one way manner. First, I do some learning here in the source. And then I send the outcome of this study to all these destinations, to all these targets, and they can take it from there. So I don't want this back and forth. I don't want information from the targets uh, to the source, which means that uh, I can deal with targets that are not known or perhaps not existing at the time. What specifically is going to be? Yes. Something. So under the assumption that the population is independent from the outcome given covariates, why can't you just send the algorithm to the targets, have them plug in their covariates, and what they get out will be valid? And the algorithm. Oh, I don't know, whatever it is. So maybe it's that I don't understand what it is that you're producing. So the statistics which can still be very different from the source to the target. Let's say I want to see what's the expectation of a particular outcome. It can be very different in the source and in each one of the outcomes. So uh, currently all I wanted to do is estimate some statistics. I can't send just these statistics. Right, okay. So it's not that what you're producing in the source population is not an estimation or a prediction of y given x. It's an aggregate of that. So in fact, that's that's going to be our approach. Uh, to instead of sending a um, value, an estimate, I'm going to send this predictor. But this is very uh, non-trivial kind of what we want from that. But let's perhaps in a few slides. Maybe. But yeah, so what is the outcome of this study that I want? I want some predictor from any individual uh, to the outcome. The thing is that we don't have, I mean, the true probabilities. And that's, uh, and so yeah, if we had the true probabilities, it will be the true predictor that really gives you for every X, the expectation of Y given X, then it would apply everywhere in the world but we don't have it. And in a sense, what we want is a predictor that's still as good. So that's the challenge, as good for every target distribution. I mean, I guess the question could be, why can, why can the target distribution build a predictor there? But it, it doesn't, the target distribution doesn't have uh, labels. The study is done in Stanford Hospital. They have conducted it. And, and that's where you have the labeled examples. The target only has unlabeled examples. So somehow, and the thing is that perhaps even kind of going a little bit further uh, to, to your question, the approach of loss minimization is, which is the standard thing. If I want to create this predictor by loss minimization on the source is very tied to the distribution. When I try to minimize a loss on one distribution, it can be give me a horrible predictor for a different distribution. Somehow, although I don't have the target distribution, I want to do something in the source that would still do well in all these target distributions. Yes. Sorry, this is kind of a related question, I think. Um, I, I think I was confused because you were saying the word study, but you don't mean someone did like a causal experiment. You mean that like they, they have labeled data in the source. We will talk about, uh, I mean, there are two things that can create a predictor, and also you want potentially to look at treatment effect. I'll talk a little bit about treatment effect if the time will agree. But here I'm just talking about um, uh, observational yeah, observation study. Um, so we want to train a predictor, which is what much of what I said, train a predictor in the source. 
And so this only me means that I need labeled examples in the source. And then when I want to infer these statistics or more sophisticated statistics in the target, I'm going to take the expectation of this predictor in the target. So in the target, all I need is unlabeled examples from the target for infer. So I'm decoupling what I need from the source and what I need from the target. And the point is that unfortunately, predictors that are trained uh, on the source using the current approaches of loss minimizations can be very bad on the target. And that's, uh, that's where the challenge is. So can it be obtained? And yes, we are going to give this universal adapter that's due to Frauke, she found it. So let me say a little bit about algorithmic fairness, although I see that this is a much more loaded topic than, yeah, so I was worried that he get complaints about not talking about causality, but in turn, it was about algorithmic fairness, but let me still uh, risk it, but that's not the topic. So I'll try to be quick. So um, the literature on algorithmic fairness it's trying to identify forms of unfair discriminations and then ways of addressing them. And just say that first one of the confusion is that uh, when people say, okay, I want to obtain fairness uh, or I'm studying fairness or doing something in fairness is the thought that, okay, now my outcome is going to be fair. And the issue is that nothing is going to be fair. And therefore, uh, we are trying to address part of the problem. And we're trying to be very clear about what we are addressing and what we're not addressing. That's kind of our approach. Um, but if you want to get something that's fair by any definition of fairness, uh, then this kind of leads to all or nothing approach, which unfortunately, more often than not, leads to nothing than to all, because we can't get all. In any case, historic oppression can manifest itself in the data in different ways, underrepresentation, mislabeling, missing features. And the question is, in which cases unfair discrimination uh, through data can be addressed? And in which cases you, can, you need to say, no, I can do nothing. The data is too problematic. There's nothing to do. I, I'm not allowing any kind of uh, targeting. targeting. And the point here that in heterogeneous uh, population, sometimes some notions of fairness actually can't promote, promote accuracy utility because they, they help identify untapped potential and because inaccuracy can be a form of discrimination. Not the only form of discrimination, but once we agree that inaccuracy can be a way to discriminate, then addressing inaccuracy could be also uh, one aspect of fairness. And there's also what Guy said about, um, if we want to kind of improve towards the world as we want it to be, we better understand what the world as it is. And this is kind of, a, this is the story we're telling here. So multi-calibration, um, um, sorry, maybe one other quick question. So here you talk about fairness <coughs> because, like, as far as I understand, you are assuming that you're using the operational data obtained over the source population. And then if you try to generalize it, then this algorithm fairness is becoming an issue. But if you were running a uh, randomized control trial, and trying to generalize that to other populations. In this case, would fairness be a concern as well? Um, with any kind of data that we have or study that we have or information that we gather, um, fairness will still be a concern because and whatever information we have doesn't apply to every individual, right? We're going to infer from some 
study that we have to other individuals. And, and we are going to do it with something that is somehow efficient, a model or, or something, even a model for, uh, for treatment effect. And now the fear is, and it's not a, a theoretic fear, the fear is that the model that you have to set them in, because you, can't, you don't have information and you don't have computational power to do something that's correct for every individual, is going to sacrifice some subpopulations for the benefit of others. And we have it, I mean, even in the example that uh, Guy showed about this uh, have treatment effect uh, predictors for, uh, that are used in practice in healthcare, they're not equally accurate for, for all groups, although they're based on study. So unless you have information about any individual and can run a test about any individual, the, case is, the question still remains, what happens after the thing? I mean, who are you sacrificing for whom? So that's why beyond problems in the data, there is additional discrimination that can happen while training. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe just, I just can't see. I don't understand your definition of what you take to be unfair discrimination in this case. Is it just inaccuracy or is it a relational concept between groups? I'm, I, okay. I didn't define what, uh, what unfairness is, but no, why? No, not in the abstract, for you. I don't understand what you're defining it to be in your I'm case. not defining the notion of fairness here uh, because it's a, there are many notions of fairness. I know. I'm not trying to define any specific notion of fairness. But in point, saying that discrimination could happen uh, through uh, an inaccuracy. For example, if you're training a predictor and it's, it's um, fitting very well to the general population, but underfitting for, um, for some uh, subgroup that is protected, then this could be a form of fairness. Of fairness. This could be, in fact, uh, the, the uh, almost the definition uh, of uh, stereotyping. So it could be that a model, the model that you're trying to, um, to study would say, okay, I'm not, because I'm optimizing something overall, I'm trying to, I have much more to gain from optimizing here than optimizing there. And therefore I'm going to treat this entire subpopulation as one and give it its expectation. And this could be, and it is a form of discrimination and addressing it could, uh, could be valuable by itself. Uh, okay, I mean, maybe you'll answer this in the next couple slides. I mean, of course, <coughs> let's just stipulate there's multiple definitions of unfairness or discrimination. I guess my question is, is there that- There's not only multiple definitions of unfairness, there's multiple uh, ways of being of discriminating. Yes. But so I guess my question is, what what is this the way that you're going to be concerned? With? I'm not talking about terms. I'm just uh, uh, that's not the topic of the discussion. But I'm happy to discuss it also. Uh, the notion um, uh, that, that we are using is this multi-calibration that I talked about, and then um, it was developed uh, by Herbert Johnson, King, Rothman, and myself. And it requires some kind of accuracy calibration, not only overall, but uh, for every large uh, subpopulation. And the intuition of how, how this is related to the problem that we talked about uh, of adaptability is that um, if, if the predictor that we come up with is not only accurate overall, but tries to be accurate for subpopulations, for many subpopulations, then in, even in a target distribution where perhaps some of the subpopulations are, have higher probability or lower probability, the predictor that we have can, be, can still be accurate. So the statistical thing we're inferring could still be correct. Okay, so perhaps I'll, I'll go quickly through that. Uh, this is the notion of multi, in fact, multi-accuracy, something that's weaker than multi-calibration that I mentioned, but it's not the original notion, but 
um, a slight strengthening from the work of Michael and others, where we allowing C to address not a subset, but some function. And perhaps the definitions and the exact theorem are less important, uh, but we have this notion of multi-accuracy and then um, when we define the class that we want to be multi-accurate with respect, we, through this notion of authenticity scores, then being multi-accurate means that you are universally adaptable. And I want to talk a little bit. Is it like some kind of uh, the same error function, the sum of two random with respect to this class function? Yes, exactly. So our approach, the approach of multi calibration is kind of very different than the traditional approach of close minimization. Instead of trying to come up with something that minimizes some loss, is an optimization, is the best in some class, we want something that has some properties that we can put our hands on. And these properties are sort of best understood through notions of indistinguishability. We want something that looks like the truth, the true probabilities for any computationally bounded adversary. This is the notion of outcome distinguishability that I mentioned, and I mentioned briefly later. So that's the result. I just want to quickly say about some of the extensions and experiments that we have. So we said if it's multi-accurate with respect to this class, then we get that our estimates are accurate in the target, not only in the, um, yes. So I think, I, I think I'm missing, um, assumption or, or I, I, so I guess that I just um, I would I would sus suspect that if you want to estimate the outcomes in the target distribution and you're using a or on the axis I was I was thinking that one might need in a, in an assumption like uh, that for all covariates X that Y conditioned on X and Z equals one is close to Y conditioned on X and Z equals zero. Um, Which is the, the assumption we started with. This is the independence assumption. Okay, okay, thank you. They, I totally just- uh, I mean, yeah, it's just the rule is very different. In the, in, for example, we have the study Stanford and we want to apply it uh, in the box, but there is some environmental hidden uh, uh, attribute. That, changes this health condition, then we cannot learn from Stanford or we need to make some other assumptions. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for reminding these are important uh, assumptions. So let me kind of, we have great discussion. So I'm going to screen a, a speak through some of the less interesting uh, things, but as I said, you can have a, uh, with multi-accuracy, you can have a good estimates at the target for a particular statistics. If we wanted some more sophisticated statistics, we need to assume a little bit more in the, in the source. So instead of just being multi-accurate with respect to this class, we'll be multi-calibrated with respect to a larger class. And then we get that we are also multi-calibrated at the target. And turns out that being multi-calibrated at the target gives us lots of great, uh, properties. In addition, there are promising experiments about this uh, universal adaptability, uh, which and I have some slides at the end, but I won't get to them, um, that show that uh, in practice, it seems, or at least they're indicating that this method can actually work and it can be comparable and sometimes even better than propensity scoring. One reason it could be better is that propensity scoring takes one uh, possible propensity function into account. And this approach would simultaneously take all of them into account. So if there is no single propensity score that, that is really capturing the entire shift in covariances, being able to deal with many of them is actually a good thing. Um, Propensity scoring for treatment effect, very high level, happy to discuss more offline. 
And so let's tell a, a story about the researchers in Israel. It's called them Noah and Noam. They started studying the effect of vaccinations uh, towards the severe sicknesses, so it's an intervention. Now we have somebody in the US, let's call, uh, call them uh, Dr. Fauci. They need to decide whether to take this and apply it to decide policy in the US, which is a different distribution. How would they do that? So it's the same problem that we had before, but uh, now we're not talking about predictions, but in terms of a uh, treatment effect. And there are two usages of propensity scoring here. Um, one is simpler. We just have the study, that's the story. We have the study in one place, we want to adapt it to a different place. And we use propensity scoring to kind of resample. Um, and universally, adap universal adaptability works in this setting just as well. A more interesting setting is when we have distribution on individuals for which we have intervention and the intervention and distribution of individuals for which we don't have the intervention and they are different. And somehow we want to view it as one study. But in the one study we, want, we would have liked to have the same distribution. And now the propensity scoring helps translate from one distribution to the other. Um, and it turns out that multi-calibration uh, with some thought can do the same. I just want to mention that you know, that multi-calibration can also be used as a way. So here in this work, we're talking about how multi-calibration can help you not do propensity scoring, but it can also give you a way to create propensity scores with some uh, multi-group guarantees. This is a work with Gopal and Sharon and Peter. Let's get to the musings in the last oh, three minutes I have. Um, so this is, has not been checked. You do it in, in, at your own risk. I'm actually uh, joking because you're already here, so you captured the audience, so you can decide not to enter. Um, so here is one set. It, so this is very, very vague, not formal and perhaps could be a basis of some discussion. So how can non-causality create discrimination? A typical recipe is for discrimination that you select a small set of features that are highly correlated with the outcome. And these will be the ones on which you're going to base your decisions. And you're going to fit a decision rule based on these features. And the fear and the very realistic theory is that these few decisions, a few variables are A, a correlated, but the relation is not causal. And furthermore, there are some proxies for protected uh, attributes. So based on, we're going to treat protected uh, sets and uh, unfairly based on that. So that's not an answer for that, but one point about multi-calibration is that multi-calibration allow you to not do this stage of first selecting a few features. Instead, it allows you to take into account a huge number of features and a, a huge number of decision rules. And potentially if one of these decision rules uh, does capture something in the causality model, uh, then, then at least we are forcing our decisions to respect uh, this decision uh, rule in some sense. So kind of formalizing what it means and what kind of, uh, how happy or unhappy we should be with it is interesting. And in the last uh, slide, I want to push a little bit more on that. Um, so again, since the introduction of multi-collaboration, there was an explosion of work, mostly still in the world of uh, applications to uh, fairness um, related notions, ad additional uh, applications, additional algorithms, including things like uh, how do you use multi-calibration for the sake of more refined affirmative action. 
but uh, there have been applications beyond fairness. And one thing is this outcome and distinguishability, which I already mentioned, which kind of gives a different paradigm. Instead of optimizing for a loss, you're trying to get something that is indistinguishable from the truth. We have universal adaptability that says that no matter what the propensity score is, we are going to do well in estimating a particular statistics. We have this notion of only predictors with Gopal and Kalai, Sharon and Vider, that then says that no matter what is the loss, so you have multi loss function optimizations. So compared to a class, you're going to do uh, better than anything in this class no matter what is the loss function you care about in a very, very general loss function. So you have ways using that to say, I don't know what the truth is. I don't know what I care about or will care about in the future is. So I want to do something that's simultaneously good for many, many different options. And the question is, can we have uh, some solution in some context that says, no matter what is the causal model that is really, uh, really applies, our solution will take all of these possible uh, causal models into account and do, do something that is reasonable in some way, regardless of which one of these causal model is the one that we care about. So that's kind of a question to discuss and with that I will end. For example, or what, what, what the causal graph for example, if that's uh, your uh, method of choice. Okay, thank you. Um, conditional independence as a channel, we call that is very important. I am wondering whether we could have a slightly less strength move assumption when we want to construct not the outcome and the treatment effect, saying that we need only the covariate that uh, modulate the treatment effect, and that all the covariates have an impact on the outcome. I know if you uh, make that side about it. Sorry, because we're talking about the, the independence. Yes. I think the independence can be relaxed in several ways, but. Uh, Question is: Is there is the rule that applies still apply? Um, we want to uncover some relation, some rule in the source that would still apply in the target, and we want I mean this rule to exist. Otherwise, when we learn something in the source, we will yeah. So and I, I completely agree that I think that there are ways of relaxing it in our uh, study and in general. I was thinking, uh, for example, if we say that the KTP, so the conditional average treatment effect, conditional like conditional to outcomes to a covariate in the source is the same as the target population, is uh, somehow less strong assumption. I don't know just if you fully sure understand. So yes. Uh, Michael or Christoph can uh, jump in. You're saying it's not a decision, something that's a decision that's been made. Yes, that's uh, with the response model. I think that I was thinking that when you're in the treatment effect, maybe only the variance affecting the modulation is uh, useful. And so we can have less variety and just ask for the KTE. That's just a question. Okay, sure. Let's take other questions offline and send them over. One forty today, right? Yeah. We started one forty today.
Oh, it was so sick. It was so sick. Yeah, it was wild. They didn't go on the Oh, yeah. uh, it was this uh, drummer called Seth. Yeah. yeah. He had this bass player called Rocco Palladino, who I was like, I hope Rocco Palladino is with him. And he was. It was sick. Yeah, it was really, really sick. Uh, everything and more. Yeah. It was, it was in. Uh, By the way, we're going to get lunch.